uh, people kept asking questions about Iran, and I told them about my 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 personal experience because I think that to me the best way of um, of relating the history of a society is through personal stories. Mm, you know? mm. I'm a storyteller, so. One of the things that we're here to talk about is also how we as elders understand everything that we've learned through a life of art and politics and of being, you know, people in the world. What is it that art alone achieves for us in life and spirit? Whoa, that's that's a very, very, very loaded question. Yeah. One simple word, everything. Everything. We are nothing without art. Uh, an artless person is not a person, as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Now, of course, we expand the meaning of art to many, many, many different things. Yes. You know? uh, yes. And, you know, and you speak about becoming elder and what do we learn in our uh, I, as an elder artist, and I say this to my students, I have learned that nothing I do in my life is separate from the art. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, that's you know, yes. Not, nothing, whether whether it's drinking a beer, it's, there is an art in drinking a beer. I mean, seriously, it is, it is, it is, it is really, um, art has, has, has encompassed all of our lives, you know, and, when we become older, we recognize that influence. Hopefully, hopefully, yeah, we we hopefully recognize and appreciate it. You know, when we are younger, we may not even notice it. It may be an an, an unconscious influence on us. But the older we get, the more we recognize how important the role of art is in our lives. I love how you say that even drinking a beer is a work of art, because I think that as I've come into elderhood, that comes across so much more clearly to me that every, all the choices we make are essentially aesthetic, which comes from the Greek aesthesis. It's breathing, breathing, mm -hmm. breathing, that the way we are in the world is either awake or asleep. We might, if we're asleep, hopefully we're dreaming. Mm -hmm. But t to me, to be an artist is to be awake. Mm -hmm. And and to be awake, you need to breathe. Yeah. Mm. The whole idea is it is breathing. Now, the difference, perhaps, the difference between an artist and somebody who's not conscious of art is the consciousness in breathing. You know, as artists, we breathe consciously. Yes. We understand what it takes to take the air in and to take it out. Yes. You know. We feel it, we we examine it, we examine every epsilon of that breath. Mm. And every time it comes back, it has a new uh, it, it it has a new uh, uh, phenomena to it, a new discovery to it. Mm -hmm. so, uh, when we dream, when we sleep and we dream, what do we see? Yes. We see the things that we could not see when we were awake. Yes, simply because our our hopefully our state of relaxation and breath is so honest and so pure inside us that allows our mind to go to places that it would not go when we are consciously mm. awake. So there are people that, for example, as we age, many many of us lose the the kind of functioning that we have earlier in life. So we have to adapt and we have to change and we have to become elders in ways that incorporate the physical, which often incorporates sleeplessness and incorporates a different kind of psychic awareness. And how is it that, how have you experienced that, that, that wave of sleeping and dreaming to change, you know, as you have come into elder life? Mm -hmm. um, I have, uh, I have learned that the moment the moment that I that my body is entering a sleep is perhaps one of the most creative moments. Mm -hmm. I really have learned that. And um, 
sometimes I hate myself for being so lazy not to get up and write something at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's really the, the, the moment of uh, of creativity. I, and I believe if we are consciously um, understanding the role of arts in our personal life, the more we lose our physical abilities, the more we gain mental and psychological ability. Mm -hmm. You know, perhaps, uh, perhaps the metaphor of Tiresias, the blind seer, can really work here. You know, when the body is not working anymore, the mind, in a conscious mind, can explore things that the body could never even dream of. Yes. You know, so the older I become and the more my body starts res resisting uh, what I want it to do, the more I switch it to my brain and allow my mind, and by brain, I mean the, the mind, the conscious mind, you know, yes. not, the, uh, not the medical uh, side of it. But um, I, I the, the more I see that my mind is moving to places that I could have never thought about mm -hmm. so the creativity and the artistry of the mind becomes stronger as the physicality of the body becomes weaker yeah matisse said that painting is an old person's game he used the word man but you evoked tiresias and the curse on tiresias given by the goddess hera who was the consort of zeus was that he had to live in a female body for a period of time to as because of this curse and in jungian theory anima and animus are very important and we have to understand the contra sexual energy in our own psyches in order to individuate and to become over a span of a lifetime to become fully human. And so you've kind of evoked that idea of contrasexuality in the dream world and in the psyche. And what do you have to say about that? Because, and let's invite Tiresias in. <laughs> well, I, I tell you another thing I've learned as an older man is that, uh, and this is so strange of a Middle Eastern man like me to say, but I think the better sex is the woman. I think the more conscious sex is the woman. I think, you know, when I did Gilgamesh, when I put, uh, mm -hmm. uh, created uh, Gilgamesh, the play, um, I really fell in love with the characters of Ishtar uh, and people like her because I realized how, how godly women can be. And I really um, think that that godliness of women is something that we, at least at our youth, resists as men. Interesting. We resist it as men, especially in a more traditional societies. And unfortunately, uh, well, I should correct myself because America is not a traditional society, but there is that <laughs> misogyny right in here. Oh, yes. It, uh, yeah, it's here, <laughs> quite alive. Um, and that is one of the reasons that the in, in my book, you see the character of women are so influential. Yes. They're so important. They are, they are there to teach me. And they do teach me. You know, in, in book one, the greatest lesson that I get is from that girl who stands up and says, you are ridiculous saying what you're saying. And, and that really was, was an education that I have never, ever uh, forgotten. Um, that is, to, to bridge it to today, that's why I sincerely believe that the movement, the revolution of woman life freedom oh. is a universal revolution. It may have started from a country back in the Middle East, but it is a universal movement. Yes. And it is a movement that uh, that's all encompassing. It's the most true sense of, 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 of change in society and tolerance. You know, women are, are tolerant, have, have a great amount of tolerance in them. 
men don't. Women have, um, and, and I'm so lucky to have two daughters. <laughs> I must say that. I'm so lucky. You know, as much of a hell they give me, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is, as, 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 I, as, as, as I age, I really respect and admire the female mentality, uh, psychic, mm. uh, sensuality, so, social awareness, uh, confidence, um, everything. I really admire that a lot more than I did at the age of 19 or 20. Oh, God. Well, one of the things that seems to me to kind of relate to when you talk about what your intentions are as an artist from the standpoint of, of your writing this memoir at age 75, mm -hmm. um, and you started earlier than that, but you talk about the way that you do theater as the it's the only art based on dialogue. So I wonder um, why is that important, first of all? And it suggests to me that there's something about the dialogue between the anima and the animus that gets permitted in the way that you do the work. And that enlarges the idea of dialogue because di meaning two from the Greek, um, that there are two energies that are intertwining. Does that? Yes, yes. I think, you know, we have that, uh, the dialogue always happens in the arts. Uh, even even a painter has a conversation, has a dialogue with his viewers. That's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not and before that, a painter has a conversation with the canvas, with the paints, with the himself. You know. That's right. Or herself and everything else. But when I say uh, theater is an or, uh, the only art based on dialogue, is because it really has a three way dialogue live there on on uh on the at the on the moment at that moment if there is a the, the, when you are acting on the stage there is a dialogue going on between you as the actor and you as the character these two people and the dialogue between character and character you know character a and character b and the dialogue between the stage and the audience you know so in this sense to me theater becomes a place where you're always conversing, you're always dialoguing. I know dialogue is not a verb, but let's make it into a verb. <laughs> you know? <We> like that. <laughs> we are always, you know, uh, conversing. I I often say to um, my students that theater is not what happens on the stage. Theater is what happens in the minds of the audience as they leave the building. Oh, yeah. You know. So it is, theater actually is the result of, is the condense, condensation of that three-way dialogue that goes on. The dialogue between the actor and, and the character, character and another character, stage and the audience, you know? And, and it is live, it's right there. It is, you cannot edit it. You cannot, um, you cannot change the color in your face. Yes. Yes, you know, it's there. It's right there. You know, it's uh, you. You can't say I didn't say this. <laughs> <laughs> you can't take that back. You can't take it back, and and that's the that immediacy of theater is what really attracts me to theater. Well, the, I wonder. I'm wondering. One of the things I'm wondering about um, is that the the philosophy of dialogue. What does it mean to us? I mean, you're speaking now from the perspective of someone who is as coming into beautiful elderhood and eldering. And what does it mean potentially to people who are entering the stage of elderhood? And particularly what might this, you know, the idea of dialogue mean to those of us who are concerned about um, the extreme divisiveness that's going on in the world right now? Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, at least in America, we live in a society that we have forgotten respect for elders. Yes. We really forgotten that. Yeah. There is, there is a reason that all traditional societies, all ancient societies, have respect for their elders. It is because I, 
I, as an elder person, I'm constantly in dialogue with myself. Yes. Because I'm constantly asking, what did I do? What could I have done? How could I do what I can do? And how could my life in influence or at least help benefit others? This, this multi-dimensional dialogue comes to you, I think, to me, it came at the elder age, at the older age, because mm -hmm. I got to a point that I realized I have done what I wanted to do. I have achieved what I wanted to achieve, mm -hmm. you know, but to what end? What am I leaving? What is going to be left after me? Yes. You know, and and how I can uh, how I can help others get to where I am sooner so they can pass me by the time they get my age. You know? Yes. Um, unfortunately, we, and I, I can't, you know, uh, earlier you talked about the uh, theoretic, uh, theor theor theocratical uh, society, <laughs> the, 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 the dictatorial society. The theocratic society. <laughs> society. And, uh, and we are facing that in here. I yes. say to, um, and I wrote that somewhere, I said, you know, um, you guys, uh, to my American friends, you guys have never experienced dictatorship. You don't understand what it means and you don't know how it comes. Yes. I see it. I see it. It's coming here. And you're so unaware of it that you're actually welcoming it. You know, many of you, we are we are uh, we are we are in the most divisive period of this country. Yes. Well, because people do not listen to elders, people do not consciously think about what can happen as a result of somebody like let's name it Trump. You know, what is what will happen to this society? What will happen to to children when they are not allowed to read all the texts when texts are taken away from them you know what will ha what will happen to to a younger generation where they are told to just stick to this little uh, gadget yes google everything <laughs> you know i mean as wonderful yeah. as google is i hate it because it you know uh, it, it gives you an easy answer how do we create the conditions for dialogue potentially between people who don't think they can talk to each other? And how do we do that? Is there a particular um, platform that we have as elders that that may enable us to do something like that? We use, you've talked a lot about you know, awarenesses that you have now that you didn't have earlier in life for a lot of reasons. And one of the benefits, one of the gifts of aging is that we do have the experience, we do have the everything that we've lived through and everything that we've failed at particularly, and still wishing for hope if we're if we have hope with us. So what how would we suggest to people that they can start to dialogue? that they can be a positive force? Well, it's a, it's a very difficult thing to do. It is a difficult thing. I fully agree. You know, and, At any age. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it is becoming more and more difficult as we move toward the single me society. Yes. So I wonder about how we particularly as elders, how we can reflect back and how we can move forward in the idea of developing, you know, seeking out our own curiosity and cultivating it and keeping conversations alive by asking questions. Well, uh, there, there are, there are uh, for me, and I can't answer for all the elders, but, you know, for me, there are um, a few things I do. Number one, poetry. Poetry helps a great deal. <sighs> You know, ah, yeah. If I am in a crowd, I suddenly start reciting a poem. Yes. You know, and people are curious. What was that? Who said that? And that yes. opens up a conversation. That's lovely. 
food is another thing. That's why <laughs> food, food, yes. Cafe dialogue. That's exactly why why I made that face and called it cafe dialogue. You know, we sit around, we eat, and of course the conversation begins from what a beautiful, what a delicious, uh, you know, dessert, and then the elder that I am, I throw in something, a wrench into the conversation. You know, I throw in something that um, that I want to lead the conversation to a different direction. Now let's talk about your children. Let's talk about us. Mm -hmm. Talk mm -hmm. about, you know, what have we learned? What have we lived for? What do we have uh, today yes. that we did yesterday? You know, how can we improve upon ourselves, our, our consciousness? And And yes, you don't reach everybody. But undoubtedly, there are a few people who continue that conversation. Yes. You know, and the flip side of it is there are a few people who do not come back to your dinners anymore. Because Fine. <laughs> yeah. We can't reach everyone. It's like, that's their choice. But but again, the, you know, the food is a great thing. Oh, yes. Patient, being together, just just hanging around. You know, um, I, I know some of my elder friends think that because they are older, they are, they are retired or they are at retirement age, they should stay home in their own little place and read or write or do whatever you want. I hate that. I think we have to go out. As, <laughs> as it's, it's our job to throw ourselves into the society. Yes. It's our job to be there, to be available. You know, we have to make ourselves available. And that's another important thing. You know, being available for others to reach you. Yes. You know. Well, so in the book, you talk about the great lover. And so what wisdom of Hafez is important to you now that you would want to share with us um, from your life perspective as an elder? Wow. Um, love. Love. You know, mm. Hafez talks about love in a way that nobody has before him. Mm. And nobody, in my, my in my view, nobody has uh, you know, since either. Because what he talks about, he says, there is a line that says, this is the, the last line of the Ghazal. It says, friends, don't find fault with Hafez for flirting. Because I recognize him as your lover's beloved. You know, look at these three individuals that Hafez is talking about. You, your lover, and the beloved. Mm. And he puts himself right in the middle of that. He says, I am your lover, and I'm also your beloved. Yes. I am my own lover, I'm also my own beloved. You are your own lover, and your own beloved. You know, so uh, the the fact that he talks about, uh, and of course, I can't, I can't shorten half as in, in two sentences, but, you know, tolerance, love, exactly, self-love and love. You can't have love to anybody else if you don't have self-love. Yes. You know, I mean, love starts with self. If we cannot love ourselves, we can love we cannot love others. Yes. You know, uh, we learn how to love by loving ourselves. And then Actually, that's in it's in Western scripture too. Learn to love your neighbor as you love yourself in a way. But I think I don't think we take that lesson in the West very fundamentally. Well, that that love radiates outward. Uh, I don't think that we take many of the uh, of our. Uh, uh, forefathers lessons <laughs> you know the way we should you know we just uh, we uh, who who can say that um uh loving the, uh, your neighbor uh, as you love yourself is what we are doing to our uh, southern border people oh yeah <laughs> you know i mean do we love ourselves like that yeah. do we love like that you know <laughs> let me read you a five line poem from hafez Okay. I think I think it's a uh, it's it's not a poem that's very famous, but to me it speaks a lot. To you know, here Hafez is talking to to one of those uh, those intellectuals, the knowledgeable, 
the ones who uh, carry the flag of do- uh, of knowledge <laughs> on, on, on their shoulders. It says, "Here's my glasses." Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't find it. I don't. I'll read it. Hey, since you are always so proud of yourself, if you don't love, you're dismissed. Don't hang around those who live uh, who live crazy with love. If don't hang around those who live crazy with love. If you are only famous for upright wisdom, the drunkenness the drunkenness of love doesn't exist in you. Go away. You are only high on wine. The pale face and painful. Sigh are the the pain felt the pained face and painful sighs are the lover's cure for this condition. Live behind fame and shame, Hafez, because you know he always addressed himself at the end. Yes. Live behind fame and shame, Hafez, because you need drunkenness. Ask for wine glass. Mm. Now. See, you're high on wine. You're, you're, you're. Uh, you know, if, if you don't love, you're dismissed. I mean, what, what more can we say about Hafiz than this? If you don't love, you're dismissed. Out. You know, the idea of love is starts with loving ourselves, mm-hmm. loving yourself, and and ex- expands to loving the whole world. Everybody. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I think that's probably a good place to end. What more can we say? A lot. <laughs> exactly. 